name is Chris. I work for a chemical company called Water Solutions. We take care of municipal water sterilization. Uh, I've been doing this job for 25 years. So water is what I do every day. I've always kept South American fish or soft water fish because I've always found they're a little bit more challenging. Uh, I just like them. It, there's more of a challenge to it. So if you could, so this was maybe five or six years ago and you go to the next one and the next one. So I had about 60 tanks at home and I kept everything from angelfish uh, angelfish, discus, but mostly a pistogram of uh, and lady acara dwarf species that didn't get too big. I like to have a lot of little tanks. Little tanks for fish and big tanks for growing them out. Okay, so cichlids are among the most popular fish in the hobby. I'm sure that someone like Mark would be able to say, we sell more cichlids than anything else. Uh, dwarf cichlids are found in about 12 genera of South American cichlids, the majority of which are fish that are less than four inches, and even about 70% of that less than two. The genus of Pistogramma is the largest group of South American cichlids. There are about uh, Aqualog and Dats actually started giving A numbers to Epistos because it was getting too hard to keep track. So right now the A numbers are up to 275 and then there's AAFs and SPs. There's about 30 of those that are waiting to be described. Other dwarf cichlid species are besides Epistogramma would be Epistogramoides, Biotechus, the Crocus, Nanacara, all again small peaceful fish. Most species of dwarf cichlids are sexually dimorphic, meaning there's a big difference between male and female, and their main prey consists of other fry of other fish, the uh, rotifers, bacteria. They've taken the groups of the large group of epistogram and broken it down into species lineage. So the largest group would be the Reagan Eye lineage, which consists of all of those fish. And so these would be decent examples of the fish that fall under that category. Most of them have a stout little body, a uh, little bit taller. So the next group would be the pretensis lineage, and it's the, probably the second smallest group of fish. And more elongate, most of these fish are found in Venezuela and Colombia. This is the group that most people are familiar with because they're the most common epistos, cockatoides, tripasiata, Bitaniata, or I'm sorry, Atahualpa. Barlowi, which is only recently, I have it up there as Barlowi, it's been given another name. Uh, and again, those are the fish that most people are familiar with. They're the things you see in pet stores. They're the things that are mass bred. All of these fish are wild types. So there's no line breeding going on there. That's actually what you would that's how they're caught out of the creek. And again, another large group of epistos would be Agazizii. And it compromises Elizabethae, Gibbsteps, Bitaniata. Again, some of the fish are real popular and they're things you see all the time. And then you have Elizabethae thrown in there, which is an extraordinarily hard to keep, really rare fish that you almost never see in the hobby. It's one of the epistos that I've never bred in captivity. And I've kept probably 30 pairs of them. And 
and they're not even a spectacular fish. <laughs> so that would be Elizabethae, and Agazizii, and Bitaniata, and Gibbiceps. They're all just as nice of a fish, but that one is like my Achilles heel. And then the last group of fish is Diplotania, and there's only one species. It is, uh, and it's a fish that I've never kept. So I have no photo of it. Okay, we can go to the next one. Other dwarf species, there's dwarf pikes. There's uh, the fish that's on the right is Nanakara sururu. That's a fish from Guyana. Uh, Tanakara candidi, Biotecus, which is another fish I've not kept. So all of those fish are found basically on this map. Uh, some of them a little further south, but not terrifically. There's only maybe two species of Pista that are found to the far east of Brazil and down towards Uruguay. So this was a really nice map. So habitat conditions for Epistogramma and dwarf cichlids in South America are actually a lot more varied than you would think. Most people think, well, South America, it's all soft water, it's all black water. There's actually three specific types of water conditions in South America. You have black water, white water, and clear water, with clear water being probably the least prevalent uh, water coming from the far north is clear. It gets more black as it travels further south. This is actually the Wapesi and Negro intersection, and you can actually see it's a confluence of waters with white water and black water joining. There's three or four spots, and it always makes for a cool picture. So again, when we talk about South American dwarf cichlids, we have to talk about the varied water conditions because what works for a fish from Venezuela is not necessarily going to be the best thing for a fish from Peru or Brazil. And water conditions, in my opinion, have always played the biggest role in success in keeping any type of South American dwarf cichlid, except for Epistogramma elizabethae, which hates me. So the largest constituent of waters that form the Amazon come from the far west, Peru, Peru, Ecuador. So, and this is wordy. I didn't know how to make it less wordy than this. Water that comes down from the Andes Mountains, which are a relatively young geological formation, still flow through a lot of geology and surface that still has a lot to give. It's not necessarily hard water, but the water has something. So you usually see in this area, at the headwaters, the water is a little bit hard. You know, we're talking maybe five grains, which would be about 22 to 25 parts per million as total hardness. Conductivity is still relatively low. Uh, and again, once those waters filter down through, you know, hundreds of miles, they're picking up more and more things. So, you know, I was always able to get away with a little bit more and had an easier time with Peruvian fish and fish from western Brazil. They were more forgiving, they were a little bit more robust and hardy. You know, for me, I could take them out of the bag, throw them in a tank, and three days later I'd have eggs. Which was always awesome, because there's a lot of really nice ones that come from that area. So. Actually, can you go back one? So again, the rivers all share a high content of dissolved solids, even though they come mostly from high altitudes. But as they travel down through all that sediment, they pick things up. So these are some pictures of habitat and waters. 
This one is actually, uh, I got permission from Tom Christopson. This is where he collected uh, Peruvian dwarf cichlid uh, Pistogramma cruzi, the true cruzi, not the one that everybody calls cruzi. And there's basically this little puddle. And you can see the water is a little bit clear because, it's, you know, it's a small, small body of water. Further down, you know, you're picking up larger bodies of water on their way to the Amazon. And the bottom right-hand picture is typical dwarf cichlid habitat. You can see there's some tetras, but there's just a lot of leaf litter, some driftwood. Pictures like this is what made me mimic this with plants. Because if this is where they came from, then they should be successful in an aquarium if it's set up similar. Especially considering easily 80% of the fish that I kept were wild caught. Next. Fish from eastern Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela share a completely different water quality aspect. It's one of the reasons that Waru Fernandez Yepazai and Altum angelfish and Santa Isabella angelfish and some discus are so difficult to keep because the water that they have is truly pure. It has almost no, no dissolved solids, no hardness at all. One of the reasons for that is because at its origin, it's coming from one of the oldest geological formations on Earth. The rock has nothing left to give. So by the time the water makes its way to rivers, it's basically flowed across granite with nothing to give to the water. Uh, there's also very little plant matter, and the plant matter that's there is, you know, lake lichens and small stuff. There's no gigantic deciduous forests or things dropping leaves. So the land in the Guyana Shield is poor in nutrients and pretty much sterile. Uh, and again, so it's highly specialized and has evolved to live in soil made only by the melanary organic humus of its own kind. So it's basically as plants are dying off, they're mulching for themselves. And the only elements affecting the condensation in rainwater in the Guyana Highlands are the organic humus through which it flows. The white sand is pretty much just, again, has nothing to give. So there's very there's no buffering action of any kind. So even by the time it makes its way to the Rio Negro, all it's picked up is tannins and humic acids and organic saponins and very, very low pH. You can actually go to uh, IBAMA, the basically the EPA of Brazil. They have you know, pages and pages of information of what the water qualities are in certain regions. So, you know, you go out towards northwestern Brazil where the Rio Negro flows into the Amazon River, pH is some, in some places two and a half. So, again, it's a very specific water quality for those types of fishes. And you would think, well, it takes them a while to get here. You know, they catch them, they put them in a bag, and they send them to the United States. We put them in our tanks. But those types of water qualities is what actually helps those fish live. There's very little bacterial activity in waters from those areas. And this is actually, and it's, I don't know why it got cut off, but there's a guy, Ed Ruiz, and he is a, he's posted tons and tons of information about Altum angelfish because he's from Venezuela. That's what he has studied. This is actually 
I borrowed this from one of his talks, and it's extremely interesting because it expounds, expands on what I was just saying, that in the upper Orinoco, creeks and streams of island origin, waters turn a turbulent white and foam covers some of the riverbanks. And that foam is actually organic matter from plants that grow along the riverbanks. Those things act as an astringent and help keep the water sterile. You look at things like turpentine, and turpentine is terpene, which comes from plants. It's just refined. So in tiny, tiny, minuscule amounts, those things are present in the water. And in minuscule amounts, they help those fish fight off the very little amount of bacteria that's present. And again, pHs can drop below 3. Most people take and think, well, South America, you know, it's hot there. I never kept a dwarf cichlid hotter than 78 degrees. Never. Too expensive when you have 60 tanks. And you're changing water all the time, so you would never keep it warm. And so under these conditions, bacteria, fungi, and pathogens in general rarely represent a threat. Again, you have to remember that in the wild, these fish have the horn of plenty. It's always new water. It's water change every 10, you know, they live in a water change. So you can change. Now, as a water chemist, I would be remiss to not try and teach you something about water. So, one of the most important things would be pH hardness, alkalinity, the general water parameters. Now, this looks very complicated. This took a really long time to write. If you switch to the next slide, this makes the previous page very easy to understand. pH is a logarithmic balance of OH, and hydrogen. So the lower you get, the more hydrogen you have. The higher you get, the more hydroxide ions you have. And it's to the 10, to the 100, to the 1,000, to the 10,000, which is why it's very easy to adjust pH when you're starting at 7. It's very hard to adjust pH. You're using more buffer if you're starting at 10 and going down or at 1 and going up. So when you start out, you, when you understand this, once you understand how pH works, it makes it a little bit easier to understand all of the other things because we're dealing with competing ions. Let me go to the next one. Hardness is a competing ion. So in the simple definition of water hardness is the amount of dissolved calcium, magnesium, and other metal ions. Hard water is high in dissolved calcium, magnesium, and those things are which are what provide buffering capacity. Usually when you see hard water, you have an alkaline pH. Because there's more ions and less hydrogen. So, and hardness is caused by compounds of calcium, magnesium. So, General guidelines for classification of waters are 0 to 60 is relatively soft. 61 to 120 is hard, and 121 to 180 is hard, and over 180, very hard. There's nowhere in Pennsylvania that's generally higher than about 120. And I know this because I borrowed this next slide. This is a map of hardness in the United States, as compiled by the EPA. So, in generally, you can see that if you were going to keep South American dwarf cichlids, we don't live in a half bad area to do that. Uh, of course, there's always going to be localized areas like Hanover and York that are primarily limestone. <laughs> so my water hardness is about 150 ppm. Now, we understand pH a little bit. We understand hardness a little bit. 
as you add competing ions, if they are metal ions or calcium or magnesium, they're going to increase conductivity. Pure water is a very poor conductor of electricity. Uh, as a matter of fact, DI water, the reason if you put it in a conductivity meter it doesn't read is because there's nothing to conduct electricity. So conductivity of substances is defined as the ability to ability to power ability or power to conduct or transmit heat, electricity, or sound. Units are in Siemens per meter. Most of the meters that we use in uh, aquariums and our hobby are in micro Siemens because the numbers are so small. Total dissolved solids is a different measurement than conductivity. It's normally about you'll have about half of your conductivity number will be total dissolved solids. So TDS is a measure of total ions in solution, which is different than hardness because, or hardness or metals. So electrical conductivity is an actual measure of ion activity of a solution in terms of capacity or trans to transmit current. So again, in a dilute solution, TDS and electrical conductivity are reasonably comparable. So if the TDS of a water sample based on the measured electrical conductance value can be calculated using the following, which is roughly half. Alkalinity. And am I losing anybody? Because I can skip these. So alkalinity is related to the pH of a solution, its basicity, which is alkaline conditions. But measures a different property. Roughly, the alkalinity of a solution is a measure of how strong the bases are in a solution, whereas pH measures the amount of chemical bases. A good example is a buffer solution, which you would use to measure pH, which can have many available bases, highly alkal high alkalinity, despite having only a moderate pH how we have buffer solutions of 4, 7, and 10. Early chemists defined the term alkalinity as the acid neutralizing power of a water solution, referring to bicarbonate, carbonate, and hydroxide ions in the water. More precisely, this is called carbonate alkalinity. So the more carbonate you have, the more bicarbonate it can neutralize. Oxygen and carbon dioxide play a role in both alkalinity and pH. Who here runs CO2 on a big plant tank? No one. When you run CO2 on a tank, the reason you run, you run CO2 during the day, you run an air stone at night because CO2 is going to use up bicarbonate alkalinity and hardness in the water, which is why it tends to make your pH fall because you're using bicarbonate. CO2 converts bicarbonate to carbonic acid, depresses the pH. You can eliminate that by running CO2 during the day, air stone at night, and switch them. One negates the other. Uh, you can switch. So the role of black water in South American fishes and even West African fishes is very important as was stated in a previous slide because you have all of these plant matters that are not only helping the fish deal with bacteria and keeping the water sterile, they're also helping to condition the water. One of a division of the company that I work for, we use tannins as an industrial chemical for boiler and cooling tower water treatment. Now, before there were polymer chemistry or, you know, before things, before 
what I would call hard chemicals that today were readily available, they had to do something. So every steam locomotive had a steam engine, a coal car, and in the coal car there was a bucket and a bucket. One had bark and the other one had potatoes. The bark was to soften the water. Because if you're traveling across the United States, you're going to get different water in New Jersey than you are in Texas, than you are in California. The potatoes were to make starch. And the starch acts as a natural surfactant, which chelates calcium. So you can have bark and potatoes and soften water in the presence of steam. That was the earliest form of water treatment. So again, the Amazon, Amazonian biodiversity of plant species is the highest on Earth, with a 2001 study finding a quarter of a square kilometer of Ecuadorian rainforest supports more than 1,100 tree species. Think of all of those leaves falling in the water. And then you see why the water is the way it is. The average plant biomass is estimated to be, that would be 356 tons per hectare. An estimated close to half a million species of plants of economic and social interest have been registered in the region. So again, you have a massive amount of Detroit water flowing across and through plant matter. That plant matter is breaking down. And tannins are the foundation of any leaf, wood, stick. It is the glue that holds everything together. This photo is actually tannins sequestering calcium at about, uh, it's, so that would be one one hundred thousandth of a uh, millimeter. The way it works is condensed tannins have a flavonoid core as a basic structure, and the hydro hydro hydrolyzable tannins are glucose esters of gallic and elagic acid. The aqueous phase pH governs the specific this speciation of metals and also the disassociation of active functional sites on the sorbent, hence metal sorption is critically linked to pH. So tannins can actually take and break calcium from magnesium, from phosphorus, from iron, and take all of those individual ions and wrap around them like a glove so that they're no longer active in the water. And another interesting thing I was talking to Mark about was they're finding that tannins can be used for mercury, cadmium, chromium remediation <laughs> instead of digging up, digging up contaminated ground. They can actually pump tannins through, remove only the tannins that are contaminated, and do in situ remediation. You can switch. Okay, now we're going to get to the fun stuff. Lots of pictures. Selecting the right fish. Who here has kept a dwarf cichlid? Who here has seen the ugly dwarf cichlid in the pet store? Okay. The ugly fish on the left is the pretty fish on the right five days later. Same exact fish. This little boy turned into that big boy. Happy water, good food, and a place to hide. Again, we talk about you know, the different types of water. If you don't necessarily want a fish that's impossible to keep, you know, if you don't want the frustration of having an ultimate angelfish, you can get an angelfish from Peru, and the thing will live in a bucket of water with an air stone in it. You can switch. There are hundreds of species of Apisto that are wine bred by really, really dedicated aquarists. 
so that if you want the most colorful fish, and they also do it with Tianacara and Lady Acara, they pick the nicest males and the nicest females, and they keep breeding them together. They take the offspring, and the nicest ones get to go make more little fish. And that's how we get things like Epistogramma agzizii fire red and gold red and Rio Meta and even this orange flash cockatoides. You know, it probably took somebody 20 years to make these fish reliably reproduce with no black spots in the fish. And when I had that fish, I think I started out with 20 of them, 20 males, 20 females, and I put them all in a 55-gallon tank, and in about three months, I had 500. I couldn't get rid of them. I was feeding them. I was feeding fried angelfish. I had so many of them. So, again, you have to, what do you want? When I was keeping dwarf cichlids, I wanted to make more dwarf cichlids as fast as possible. So the tank on the top is how I kept almost all of my fish. The tank below it, I had a pair in there that I never saw. So important factors are obviously water quality, shelter. We saw pictures of their habitat. There's a lot of places to hide. And you would think, well, I want to see this fish. I didn't go spend $40 on two fish that are an inch long to never see them. What you find is that you put them in a tank like the picture on the top, and you will find them moving around from place to place all day long. When they're breeding, you'll have breeding displays, males chasing females. And if you look, I have two spaces to breed on the left, two spaces to breed on the right, and an almost solid physical barrier in the middle. This is important because female dwarf cichlids are cranky, just like pregnant women are cranky. One side is for the male to hide in after the babies are born. <laughs> you can switch to the next one. I almost kept all of my epistos solo. If I had a tank, it had a pistos in it, and that was pretty much it. They are a good community tank fish. They're peaceful, and they won't eat anything that can't fit in their mouth. They're not usually a mean fish that goes and beats everything up. They're not equidins or any of the medium-sized Central American fish. So when I did keep them with other fish, my tetra of choice was always pencil fish. Didn't matter what it was, for a lot of reasons. Pencil fish have a really small mouth. Pencil fish primarily s swim in the top zone of water, and they can't outcompete your dwarf cichlids for food. So, yeah, and that's an important consideration because if you put, you know, a bunch of cardinal tetras in there, the food's never going to make it to the bottom. If you put a bunch of hatchet fish, the food's not going to make it to the bottom. You have to give them a fighting chance. I almost always kept at least a pygmy cory or two in the tank. Every tank I had, I kept a little a hostatus or a pygmaeus or something in there because you need a cleanup crew. And when you're breeding, you're feeding massive amounts of food. So I always had these little roly-poly coreys swimming around the tank with orange bellies full of baby brine shrimp. Odos are also a good tank mate. They're peaceful. Uh, next slide. So, we talked about shelter. And you saw in the previous slide that I would keep leaves in the tank. I would either order India almond leaves or I would throw uh, oak leaves in sometimes alder cones, anything to help get water a little bit brown and give places to hide. I also really like to use halved coconuts. Number one, I love a coconut pie. Number two, I would take the coconut, saw it in half, and then say, okay, my female is this big, I'm going to make that hole so that only she can fit through it. 
because I don't want the male going in there and eating the eggs as soon as he gets freaked out. So if only she fits, he will actually swim and keep his ovipositor by the hole in the cave, fan his milk in, the female lays the eggs on the top of the coconut, they all get fertilized. He can't get to them. She doesn't bring them out of there until they're hatched. So it was a really good recipe for success. I had some, you know, ceramic caves. They were okay. But again, the coconut shells, eggs wouldn't fungus on them because you couldn't really grow a bacterial layer on them. They would keep themselves clean. Uh, that is a pistogram of barley, and that is a pistogram of banchi. I always fed dwarf cichlids universally live food. Not because it was easy, but because I had low mortality, I didn't have instances of disease or bloat or things like that. So, and when I say prepared foods, I mean frozen foods. I would feed them, you know, uh, brine shrimp, black worms, Sometimes I would feed them uh, mosquito larvae, not very often. Again, we're talking about a fish that's an inch long. I think it's sit there eating a mosquito larva for an hour. And fry, I kept, I hatched probably a can and a half of brine shrimp a month. I always kept white worms, I always kept vinegar eels, I always kept rotifers. I would take dead fish or dirty, filthy water from clean and sponge filters, and I had a 55-gallon drum behind the garage that was clear with a big cover over it. That made Daphnia. It would turn green like that. I'd have Daphnia. That was actually, I learned that from Bob Goldstein when we went to Raleigh. This is my favorite part of keeping dwarf cichlids. Each species has, it seems like every species has its own individual dance. This is Epistogramma species bright bending. That male would, you would do, feed them well, do a water, 50% water change, and in two hours, he would be dancing for her. And he'd do that for an hour. And she would go from spot to spot, and he would show her how awesome he was. And a week later, there'd be fry in the tank. Next one. This is a pistogram of banshee. I always kept these more, more females than males. There was always probably five to one. You can see that there's one. In these pictures, there's two females fighting over one male. So it's imaginary. If I didn't keep this species with more females than males, when they spawned, I would only get female fish. Once I kept more females than males, I started getting even ratios. Why, I don't know. I've talked to, I've talked to Tom Christensen about it. I've talked to... Uh, A lot of people. It's just one of those things. I tried everything. I tried cold water, hot water, hard water, soft water. I got all females. You know, and maybe not all, but if you have 150 fish and you only have two males, something weird is going on. I started keeping more females in the tank. I was getting the same amount of fry per, per spawn but I started getting 50% males, 50% females, almost dead on. It was almost like one female made all males, one female made all males. Okay, here you go next. All epistos lay eggs, just like all cichlids. Uh, so the female on the top, that's probably day one, what I always called the fry parade. Because once, once they were free swimming, she would just, they would all bring them out of the cave and let them swim around. 
the fry on the top is probably a millimeter and a half long. The next one down is probably two millimeters long. And again, on the guy on the top, you can see he's got a belly full of brine shrimp. They would go from about that millimeter and a half size to an inch in maybe a month. They would get a 50% water change every day. They ate live food every day. As soon as they were more than a quarter of an inch long, they got pulled and thrown in a 55 gallon tank. When they got to be, when you could, when I could tell what species they were, because sometimes I'd have to mix them up because I didn't have room. They would be, you would, they would have picked up some color and some characteristics. Plus, I kept some notes. And again, you can see have coconuts. And I always have them the long way because that way they're not too tall. I actually tried, you know, you have coconut like a football. I tried cutting them this way, not so good. Laid them down and cut them much better. I don't know if it was because when the milt was fanning in, it didn't get all the way up to the top. But I would find egg tall coconut huts with eggs that hadn't hatched as opposed to low coconuts with eggs that all hatched. Now, I just talked about how important water quality and all these other things are. But sometimes, stuff happens. I threw these fish in a bag and dragged them to the ACA in Cincinnati, and they spawned in an empty tank on the silicone. So rules aren't always rules. Nature will find a way. I had a really easy time selling those fish, too. Next slide. Almost all of the dwarf cichlids are good parents. I mean, you saw in the previous slides, females guarding their little clutch. There are two species of Episto that are mouth brooding cichlids. And they're very unique because one is Epistogramma barlii, where the female takes, the, takes all of the care of offspring. Uh, the two pictures on the right are Epistogramma barlii female. She's got a big mouthful of fry. The bottom left-hand corner is Epistogramma kelleri, which up to about seven or eight years ago was an undiscovered fish from the very southernmost part of Brazil at its junction with Peru. They're a biparental mouth brooding dwarf cichlid. You can see the female has a mouthful of fry, the male has a mouthful of fry. Male at his largest was probably three times larger than she was. It's the biggest dwarf cichlid. It's the biggest epistogram I have ever kept. He was also probably the prettiest. Uh, you can go to the next one. Again, top right-hand picture is a pistogram of Kelleri. I've had people look at that picture and ask me, what kind of African cichlid is that? Uh, the fish on the top right is a pistogram of Pebus. Bottom, or I'm sorry, bottom top left is a pistogram of Pebus. Bottom left is a pistogram of Nisanai. And the bottom right is species bright And you can go to the next one. Somebody said, did you see the book that's in the auction? They're in the <laughs> that's so there are a lot of decent books. There's a lot of reference material. And I actually could have laid, after I took the picture at three o'clock this afternoon and added it to my lecture right before I left the house, I realized there were five more books on the shelf that I forgot to take a picture of. Uh, the DATS books on dwarf cichlids are amazing. They have the best photography. They're, I actually like the DATS books better than the Aqualog books, and they're really good for identification because they give you different, uh, different mood colorations. If 
I was always able to tell more about what an Episto was based on their fear coloration than their actual relaxed. Because when they go to that black bands, there's no doubt when you see that what they are if you have like a DATS catalog or uh, Romer's books. You know, he has pictures of going through all of them. And I would get, you know, phone calls primarily from Mark asking me, what, what fish is this? And I would sit there and go through all those books and say, it's one that I want or it's one that I don't want. Yeah. In George Barlow's book on cichlids, if you can find it because it's out of print, it's probably one of the most interesting things you'll read. Uh, his research on cichlids, on dwarf cichlids, is old, but extremely interesting and captivating. It's a good book to read. It's worth trying to find. I actually found that one on eBay. 